Hey everyone, John DeLaHaye here with 2S and Performance and I'm back for another episode of the CAM Files for Practical Machinists. This now marks the fifth episode of the CAM Files and I have a very special episode for you guys where we're going to learn five bullet points to programming. In my last episode, we learned how to successfully adapt a program from machining aluminum to machining magnesium without burning my house down. We also learned how to set our chamfer tip offset to prevent colliding with features on the part causing occlusion. We also learned how to set our work offsets and also how to set our height for our ball and mill when doing corner radiuses. We also learned how to reuse existing soft jaws for second operations. If you're interested in learning any of these topics, go to the Practical Machinist YouTube channel and go check out my last episode. So I finally got my newest machine in my shop, wired up and leveled when my good buddy Kincaid Pavage hit me up and told me that he had a new bike build project that he was working on and that he wanted a ignition cover and a clutch cover that would be custom machined from billet and that would stand out from the rest. The custom bike that Kincaid is building is a giveaway bike for his YouTube channel. It's a 2001 Suzuki Arm 125 motocross bike. These bikes were extremely popular in motocross racing during the 2000s, and they were a weapon of choice for motocross riders such as Travis Pastrana and Brandon Jessman. Kincaid runs a YouTube channel where he custom builds special bikes step by step while documenting his process, and then gives the bike away to a lucky winner when he's finished building it and testing it. The custom parts that Kincaid asked me to machine for him are the main side covers for the liquid-cooled 125cc two-stroke engine, known as the clutch cover and the ignition cover. The stock OEM covers that come on the engines from the factory are always cast and are either aluminum or magnesium depending on the manufacturer and the model of the bike. So why make covers machined from solid billet? Well, let's be honest, they look really, really cool. And besides how good they look, they also give you a chance to save weight and increase oil capacity for the engine. Most definitely, the number one benefit is strength and durability. Factory race team bikes have been utilizing CNC machined clutch covers since the 90s at least. With the who, what, how, and why out of the way, it was now time to send the stock covers out for 3D scanning by my engineer so that I could get usable step files to begin programming the prototypes. Once I had the solid model step files emailed back to me, it was time to start the programming off with the ignition cover. So now that I have my solid model for the ignition cover, I'm going to show you guys how I set my stock size and how I located my model inside of the stock and how I set my work coordinate system. Let me show you how. So for my OP1 setup, I positioned my model 90 degrees sideways so that the longest stock dimension would be on the x-axis. For my stock mode, I always select fixed size box and adjust the values until I find a good stock size for the model. A size that can be commonly purchased in plate or flat bar for future production. My model position, I always select offset from top so I can leave as much stock as possible underneath the model for clamping and rigidity reasons. I prefer to leave 25,000 stock on top of the model so my face mill can take a decent depth of cut and leave a nice finish. So for my work coordinate system, I like to choose a point that's based off the stock and I usually set that in the center and I set my Z0 as the top of the stock. It's pretty basic and pretty straightforward, but that's how I like it running negative offsets. So for OP1, I always start things off by drilling my mounting holes through the stock and then jumping into the adaptive roughing of the covers outline with a half inch roughing end mill. Different machinists have their own styles and philosophies on roughing strategies, but I'm a big believer in high speed machining. This style is where the RPM and feed rate of the machine are running fast, while the radial engagement of the end mill always stays around 10 to 20%. The idea is to remove material as quickly and efficiently as possible while keeping the spindle load down and pressure off of the setup stock and work holding. For this roughing operation, I opted for the 2D adaptive roughing of the outline with two step downs by choosing multiple depths in the passes tab and setting the max roughing step down to 750 thousandths. My optimal load was set to 60 thousandths while running the tool at 1300 SFM and feeding at 205 inches per minute. I ran the adaptive roughing passes to rough in the outline and then 3D adaptive roughing passes for all, the, all of the curve features. 
I used the same cutting parameters for both, but left seven thousandths of radial and axial stock to leave for the curve features so that the quarter inch ball end mill would have a little more to bite into when finishing and leave a nice finish. So once my 2D outline contour was finished and chamfered, it was time to drip feed my 3D finishing program to my old Fana controller. Here, I'll show you how I programmed it. Sometimes programming a good 3D toolpath in Fusion feels like throwing darts at a dartboard. 3D contour is usually my go-to in this situation, or even ramp. But with the odd shape of the cover, neither did it for me. I tried more spiral, spiral, hell even radial. I wasn't happy with any of these. I rolled the dice and gave Geodesic a shot and was actually really satisfied with the toolpath. That was until I noticed it was cutting conventionally in the wrong direction on a specific section of the part. I tried everything to rectify this issue. In the passes tab I tried to change the direction drop down menu from one way to the other way. No matter what I changed I couldn't get the Geodesic path to work in my favor. In the end, I went with the 3D toolpath known as Flow. It did everything I needed without cutting the wrong way and leaving a bad finish. So for the final touch on the covers, Kincaid had told me he wanted custom engraving with both of our logos as a sign of collaboration. He also wanted an old school Suzuki S symbol pocket milled into the center of the cover so he could fill it in with a darker color when applying Cerakote. After creating a sketch on the top of the face of the model and pasting the special geometry that I needed for my logos, I then negatively extruded the Suzuki S shape minus 15 thousandths to create a pocket. My recipe here for milling text shape pockets for designs and logos is fairly simple and as follows. First, I click on the 2D milling toolpath drop down menu on the top left and select pocket. Second, I select my tool, which in this case the tool size is a 1 8 ball end mill. This will do. After checking over my feeds and speeds, I then click over to the geometry tab and then select the outline of the bottom of the pocket as a closed chain. Next, I go to the Passes tab and set my maximum step over value to just 10 thousandths. After doing this, make sure to check the box right below that says Allow Step Over Cusps. Lastly, you can use the radial stock to leave value as a way to adjust the pocket shape. You can preview it in the machining simulation until you get it to the right shape and size for what you're going for. In this case, I set my radial stock to leave at minus 25 thousandths and I think the S came out spot on. Overall, I must say I'm pretty happy with how the first op came out, and it really reminds me how important it is to experiment with all of the different 3D surfacing toolpaths and really learn the different parameters and ways to control them. After machining op 1, it was time to program and run op 2, which required that soft draws be machined to accurately and firmly hold the cover in place with the remaining stock to be machined off. If you've watched my previous episodes of the CAM files, then you already know my technique and philosophy behind programming and machining soft jaws. So to save time for this video here, I'm going to recommend that you go back and watch my first and second episodes of the CAM files to get brought up to speed on this step of the process and how I do it. The episodes will be linked in the description.
So now that we have our work holding set up for the next operation, it's time to program op to and get into the meat and potatoes of how to machine these covers so that their mating surfaces remain flat and we avoid warpage. So, for the second op, I set my stock mode to proceeding setup and then check the continue rest machining box so that I could carry on with the leftover stock from op 1. For my origin, I chose the center of a drilled through hole in the back left corner. I chose this hole location because I figured it being against the fixed jaw might mean this WCS location would be more repeatable than the front holes. To do this, I set my origin mode to selected point, and then I clicked on my hole location geometry that's at the same height as the top of the model. The final step was to set my orientation mode to z-axis and x-axis, and then select the colored lines in which ways I wanted my arrows to go for my WCS. The first order of business was to remove the remaining stock material, also known as the hat. Some machinists have a different approach to this, such as adaptive or dynamic milling, but I prefer my method because if length or width of the stock changes from OP1 for future production runs, I won't have to change the stock size for OP1 in the project file and have to regenerate toolpaths and repost the code. I do this by simply running a 2D contour of the outline of the part while stepping down to remove the tabs of remaining stock. I leave 20 thousandths of radial stock when I do this, and when I roughed up one 10 thousandths lower than the model bottom, it guaranteed that there would be no burrs at this stage. Once the outline is cut off, I simply run a facing pass with my half inch roughing end mill as fast as I feel like running in both directions. In this case, it's 1,300 surface feet per minute at 205 inches per minute, again with a 10% step over to prevent tool pressure from shifting the part in the soft jaws. I also leave five thousandths of axial stock for a finishing pass. Before I finish face, I run roughing step downs along the inside edge of the cover, just deep enough so that the tip of the chamfering tool will clear without hitting stock material. There is an important reason why I do this. When I clamp the part in the soft jaws, I try to use only enough pressure to keep the cover from moving. Once the inside material of the cover is roughed out completely, it causes the cover to bow in on itself slightly due to clamping pressure. I have found my best results by chamfering and facing before the majority of the internal stock is removed from the cover. If I wait until after, the chamfers will no longer line up well with the edges and the mating surface will not be flat. When it comes to roughing out the majority of material inside the cover, Fusion basically has an easy button for this. For my toolpath type, I chose 3D Pocket. I then selected the inside edge of the model and kept all of my roughing tools same parameters for feed and RPM. All I had to do was make sure the rest machining box was checked in the geometry tab. Then go to the passes tab and set my maximum roughing step down value to 50 thousandths. Also I set the axial and radial stock to leave for the finish passes to 5 thousandths each. Not only did I check the reduce air cutting for pocket clearing box in the geometry tab, I also set the depth of the cut for the step downs to 50 thousandths so that I could make much larger radial step overs and still run fast. For the finishing passes on the slopes and corner radii inside the cover, I opted for old trusty, the 3D contour. I then selected a quarter inch ball end mill as my tool of choice and set it to climb mill with a maximum step down of 10 thousandths. I made sure to select my geometry as chains, only where I needed it to go. I also set my top height accordingly. The very top radii in the corners would be done further on in the program with a 1 8 inch ball end mill. With the tool containment on center and contact only box checked, everything finished nicely on the bottom except for one tricky section that I finished off with a scallop 3D pass. To finish the center floor, I just ran a half inch end mill with a basic 2D pocket tool path with a step over of 200 thousandths. To finish off the ignition cover, I created one last 3D contour tool path in which I selected a 1 8 ball end mill in order to match the radii of the corners. In the passes tab, I set the max step down value to 10 thousandths for a nice finish and left smoothing turned on as usual. I kept the geometry chain selected as the top inside edge of the cover and left tool containment on center with the contact only box checked. I made sure to go into the heights tab and set the bottom height as the same edge I selected for the top height on the last 3D contour path 
that I ran with the quarter inch ball end mill. So with the Suzuki RM125 ignition cover prototype complete, I could not have been more happy with how it came out. So I most definitely finished both prototypes for King Kate on time, but if I included my process for machining the clutch cover here, this video would be twice as long. If you're really interested in seeing that part machined, let me know in the comments below. Also, if you're still curious about the five programming bullet points that I mentioned in the beginning of this video, go check out the video description and you'll see them listed. In conclusion, it was really cool to see what Ken K did with his custom billet covers and how insane his RM125 bike build came out. Make sure to go check out his YouTube channel so you can witness the amazing work he does and see the finished bike that these covers went on for yourself. If there's a topic you would like to see addressed or have an idea for a future episode, please drop it in the comments. Until next time, this is Jonathan Dillahay from 2SM Performance bringing you another episode of The Cam Files for Practical Machinists.